Hello, uh, I'm Randy from uh, Bernina of America, and uh, today we have a webinar called Creative Surging with Overlocker Feet uh, with Mary Beck. I have a couple of things to say before we begin the webinar. If you have any questions for the presenter, type into the questions box and we will have a questions session at the end. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch on Bernina.com and YouTube. Uh, if you are viewing on an Apple product, um, if you can't see the screen, please swipe left or right. We do have one handout today, which you can access on the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, if you do experience audio or visual issues once the webinar begins, please follow these steps. Please exit the webinar and then uh, close your browser, relaunch your browser, and then re-enter the webinar. Again, the webinar is being recorded, so you won't miss anything. And then if you have any questions, we'll try to answer as much as we can at the end of the webinar. And with that being said, I now present you mary beck all right great okay are you sharing your screen all right let's see what whoops okay give me a sec it just disappeared on me there we go and All right, so everybody should be able to see my screen now. And thanks, Randy, and welcome everybody to today's webinar on creative surging with overlocker feet. I am so glad you could join us today, and I hope when we're done, you will be inspired to pull out your overlocker and all those feet and get creative. So just a brief overview of how today is going to go is I'm gonna do a quick review of some of the overlockers that are in the Bernina and Burnett line and the feet that you can get to do creative stitching with them. However, our focus is going to be on the L8 series, so I will go into more detail with those feet. Then I will go over the basic supplies for our tote and then the techniques for making both sides of the tote bag. There are two different sides with different techniques on each one. And then at the end, I'll review a few basic tips on constructing the tote. It goes together pretty much like a regular tote bag, and you do have the detailed instructions on your handout. And then at the end, we'll answer any questions that you might have. And again, don't worry, this is going to go rather quickly, but you will have access to the recording later. So let's start off by asking, why do we need so many feet? Well, let's start in your closet. I bet you have a variety of shoes for different purposes and occasions. And while one particular shoe will maybe work for more than one occasion, you know that the hiking boots are best for the mountains and your pumps are best for going out to dinner. So the same thing applies for our overlocker feet. It's important to have the right foot for the right job. Whether it's applying sequins, making gathered ruffles, inserting piping, or adding binding to your project. If you're using the right foot, that job is going to be so much easier and a whole lot more fun. So let's start off by taking a look at some feet that you can use on your Burnett overlocker. If you have the Burnett 44, 48, or 64, you can get this box of feet that has six different feet in it for different techniques. And you can do piping, ribbon insertion, elast use the elasticator, and so on. And what I love about this box is all the feet are stored in that box, and there's a handy instruction guide to show you how to use each of the feet. If you have a Burnett cover stitch machine, like the B42 or 48, there's another selection of feet. Whether you want to make belt loops, make cording, do different types of hemming, you can do it right here with these feet. What if you own the L450 or L460? These are the feet available for those machines. There's a blind hem foot, and actually there are two blind hem feet. One is the 0.5 for lightweight fabrics, and the other is a 1.0 for your heavier fabrics. Then you have an elasticator, a gathering foot, 
and a multi-purpose foot, which can be used for inserting beads and sequins, inserting zippers, and making piping. But we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about the feet that are available for the L850, L860, and L890. But a little word about the differences between these feet. If you own an L850 or an L860, you're going to wanna to get feet that are designated with an L, such as this beading and sequin foot number L15. If you have an L890, you're going to want to purchase feet that are designated with a C, such as this beading and sequin foot C15. And as you compare the feet, you can see there is a little bit of a difference in their size. And they are not interchangeable. The L feet must go with the 850 or 860, the C feet must go with the 890. Each foot also has some very useful markings. We're looking at the standard foot for the L890. On the far right hand side is a little indentation and this matches up with the cutting knife when it's set at a cutting width of six. B and C match up with your right and left overlock needle and then D, E and F match up with the cover stitch needles. And these markings are really handy when you wanna know exactly where the needles are going to hit on your fabric. Now, each foot does have its own set of markings. So when you purchase your foot, make sure you save and read the instruction sheet that comes with the foot and look at the diagram explaining the pieces, parts of that foot. So let's get started with the feet. The first one I'm going to show you is the elasticator foot, which is number 14. And as the name implies, this foot will guide and stretch elastic as it's surged into your fabric. Now this is perfect for lingerie, swimwear, sportswear, and your home textiles. And the elastic sizes you can use range from about a quarter inch to three quarters of an inch. Now the way this foot works is the front section lifts up and then you see a roller and you insert your elastic under the roller and then push the top back down. There are two screws on the front. The right screw adjusts the position of the elastic so that it's not cut by your knife. And the left screw adjusts according to the width of your elastic so that it will be nice and straight under your foot. You can adjust the tension on your elastic with the screw on the top. Turn it all the way to the right and it's going to put the tightest tension and get stretch out that elastic the most. Now I should point out that there are some differences in elastic when you purchase it. And I have found that knit elastic stretches a lot more than your woven elastic. So have fun playing with this and look at the time you'll save when you can put the elastic in while you're sewing without having to make a casing and go through the steps of inserting the elastic. The next foot is the beading and sequin foot number 15. And with this foot, you can search strings of beads and sequins along a fabric edge using a rolled hem or a pico stitch, or you can use the flat lock stitch and insert it in the middle of your fabric. You can use sequins and beads up to six millimeters or a quarter inch in diameter. The way it works is that the beads lay in that front groove and then exit out through the tunnel in the back of the foot. And you don't have to worry about the knife or the needle hitting the beads and sequins. I will recommend that if you go towards your wider beads and sequins, that you consider using a overlock stitch instead of the rolled hem. Whoops, went too far there. Okay, next foot, it's the piping foot. And this is foot number 16. And there are actually two of them, a small and a large. With this foot, you can create fabric covered cord, insert piping into a seam, and even insert zippers into your project. The small piping foot uses piping up to about three millimeters and is really preferred for your lighter weight fabrics. For your medium and heavyweight fabrics, use the large one. And I actually do use the large piping foot the most because that's the foot that I use for my zippers. There's a tunnel underneath the, the length of the foot so my zipper or my piping stays straight while I'm sewing it. And I don't have to worry about it scooching over to the left near the knife or farther away towards the needle. Do you like making wired ribbon? If you do, the cording foot number 17 is gonna to wanna to be added to your collection. 
you can surge cord up to two millimeters in diameter into a rolled hem or a surged edge on wovens and knits. Now, cording can be fishing line, fine wire, pearl cotton, or fine yarn, as long as it fits through the guides on the foot. And it will add structure and body to sheer and lightweight fabrics as well. So how this works is the cording is fed through the front guide and then down through that hole right in front of the needles. In the back end of the foot, there's a groove on the underneath side to keep guiding that cording as it continues past the foot. It's really easy. And if you've been nervous about using wire, don't worry because these guides keep the wire away from the knife and away from the needles. You're going to get perfect gathers using the gathering foot number 18. You can gather single layers of fabric or you can gather and sew to a flat piece at the same time. So you can make ruffled edges or puffing strips. Now how this works is there's a flap on the bottom of the foot and I think you can see it here on the picture. And that gives a little more contact with the fabric as it's gathering. And so you would place your ruffling strip on the bottom right side up and then if you want to insert flat fabric take that and place it right side down into the groove on the top of the foot. The blind stitch foot number 19 does a blind stitch hem very similar to our number five foot on our sewing machines. You can make beautiful invisible hems in medium and heavyweight fabrics. However when you go to your light and knit fabrics you might want to consider using a flat lock stitch and then the latter stitch is going to show on the right side to give a decorative look. And I actually like to use this blind stitch foot for my flat lock stitching. The adjustable guide helps me to position the fabric in just the right spot for a perfect flat lock. Now I will say the clear foot number 27 ranks among my favorites. It's useful for all of your overlock stitching. And if you have the L890, you can use it for your combo stitching, cover stitching, and chain stitching. Because it's clear, you're going to have precise stitching and placement. So if you've got lines marked on your fabric, you'll easily be able to see them. At the front of the foot, there's an opening where you can insert tapes, ribbon, or elastic. On the L27 foot, these tapes can measure to about 3 eighths of an inch. And then on the 890, on the C27, we can go up to about a half of an inch. Now let's talk about some of the feet and accessories we can use on our L890. The L890 is an overlock combo machine, meaning it can do all the overlock stitches, it can do combo stitches, cover stitches, and chain stitches. The first foot I wanna show you is the cover stitch compensation foot number 13. This foot compensates for uneven fabrics, such as your bindings and necklines and hems, but I also like to use it for top stitching. The outer toes float to help guide the fabric and prevent sideways movement when stitching folded edges, seams, and ribbing. Recently, we introduced the binder attachments, and these are fabulous for adding binding to your projects. There are two. One is a double fold binder and one is a single fold binder. You will need to also purchase the accessories holder, but you only need one and that will attach to the bed of your machine and then you can insert your binder attachment. Now you might notice that there are two sets of screws with the accessories holder. One set of screws works with the L890, but the other set of screws will attach the binder attachments to our Burnett cover stitch machine. So if you have the Burnett 42 or the 48, or maybe one of our retired over um, cover stitch machines, such as the 1300 and the L220, you'll be able to use the binder attachments on these machines as well. So the double fold binder attachment is number C21. And with it, we can add a bound edge to projects and also make ties and straps. And if you've ever made a strap where you had to turn it right side out, I think you're really going to appreciate using the binder attachment instead. Both the top and bottom fold under for a finished edge. The fabric does not have to be cut on the bias. However, if you are going to be stitching around a corner or a curved edge, you will wanna do that. 
And a little bit of starch also helps in the handling of the binding strips. You'll cut the strips a scant one and a half inches wide, and the finish is about three eighths of an inch. Now I will point out that the directions with the attachment say that you will get the best result with the needle in the left cover position, but we're gonna talk about that more later. The single fold binder attachment number 22 is probably my favorite. It works like the other binder attachment. However, only the top edge of the strip is folded under. The bottom half remains flat. And then you would go back with your scissors, preferably an applique scissor, and trim close to the stitching. And the reason I like this is it reduces bulk, which is perfect on a knit t-shirt. But I also found a use for it on an unlined jacket. The directions called for a Hong Kong seam finish, and this was the perfect attachment to do that, and I had a little less bulk on my seam edge finish. You'll cut strips at about an inch and a half, and the finish is again three-eighths of an inch. Now you're getting all of these feet and attachments. How are you going to keep track of them? Well, we have the Bernina app for that. So you'll go to your app uh, store on your device and download the app. And then at the bottom, you will see a little presser foot, which is where you can keep track of your feet and your machines. So you'll set up an account that's free and then tell the app what machines and what feet you have so that when you're at the store and they have a sale, you can easily figure out which ones on your wish list are the ones you want to get. Because I bet it's happened to you. You've been at the store, they're having a sale and you're going, do I have that foot? And do I really want to send somebody in my, into my sewing room at home to figure out if I have that foot? So it's a lot easier to have it on your phone so that you have it with you all the time. Okay, so we've talked about the feet. So let's start talking about the project and the things you're going to need to make the project. Don't forget, you are going to be able to download the handout so that we'll go through all the steps and supplies for making the tote bag. So I use the L890 combo machine. Some favorite features on this machine for me are one, the touch screen for selecting the stitches. I love when I select the stitches, my tensions and stitch length are automatically set for me. The air threading's pretty sweet. It makes it quick to thread the machine. And then there's all that space and light. These are the feet we're going to use. We will use the blind stitch foot number 19, the clear foot 27, the piping foot number 16, and the gathering foot number 18. We're also going to use the cover stitch compensation foot number 12 and the accessories holder and the double fold binder attachment number 21. Now, if your machine does not have cover stitch capability, the techniques that we do on the cover stitch side of the L890 can be done on your sewing machine. So don't worry, you will be able to replicate it on your sewing machine instead of the overlocker. The fabrics I purchased to make the blocks of my tote bag were in a solid kind of a read because we're doing some decorative stitching with decorative thread and I wanted to make sure they showed up. So I chose five fat quarters from the Tilda Chambray collection. I also got a third of a yard of 54 inch wide denim, and this is a Robert Kaufman denim, and a co coordinating tilde print called Windy Blue. I collected some trims. I have this quarter inch wide lace trim that will match my fabrics. I actually purchased ready-made piping. Yes, I know my piping foot can make piping myself, but you know, when you find the right color, sometimes it's just easier to go with the pre-made. And then I use this one and a quarter inch wide Tilda Old Rose Jacquard ribbon. And I bet you've got some decorative ribbons in your stash that you could use. I used one inch black polypropylene webbing for the straps and a half yard of fusible fleece to give the bag just a little bit of structure. And then I pulled out my threads. This is a great time to play with your decorative threads. Of course, you'll need your serger thread for some construction, but I love the Wonderfill 12 weight threads. Those on the bottom are called the Wonderfill Spaghetti. And then in the upper right is Wonderfill Glamour, which has just a little bit of metallic in it, but don't worry, you're not gonna have any problem using it. 
The green thread is Wonderfill Soft Lock, which is a texturized thread. And then I needed a few spools of thread to match my fabrics. And I went into my embroidery thread collection, which is Isocord thread. And if you're a machine embroiderer, I bet you have lots of colors that you can use to match your fabrics. We will be using ELX size 9014 overlockers for most of the project. However, for the very first block, we're going to use a size 90 top stitch needle. The recommended needles for the L8 series overlockers are ELX needles. However, you can use other needles. Just be aware that you will have to do a quick test sew to make sure your tensions are good. We're going to be putting decorative thread in the needle and the eye of the top stitch needle really worked out a lot better. And of course, you'll need your basic sewing and serging supplies. And if there are any other specifics as we go along, I'll be sure to mention it. So let's get started. We're going to work on the four blocks on one side of the tote bag first. And the first block we're going to do is the flat lock ribbon block. For this block, I use the olive fat quarter, the wide ribbon, my top stitch needle, some serger thread, and the Wonderfill Glamour 12 weight thread. And this particular color is boysenberry. And we're going to use the blind stitch foot number 19. Again, I call this my flat lock foot because I can adjust that guide just where I need it. So this is how I set up my foot at the machine. I adjusted the guide so that it is even with the left needle pin in the stitch plate. So as you are looking down into your stitch plate, you can see two needle pins that are just offset from your sewing machine needles. And if you put it on the left needle pin for this stitch, I think you will get a really good result. But of course, you'll want to test on your machine as well. Set up your machine for a three thread flat lock wide, which uses the left needle and is stitch number five. Lower your knife because we're not going to trim any fabric and put serger thread in your loopers. The glamour thread is going to go in the needle. Now, have you ever set up your machine for a flat lock and wondered, which thread is going to make the ladder stitches and which thread is going to be the looper side when I open the flat lock? Well, on the L860 and the L890, on the touch screen, you can preview that. So we're looking at what the stitch looks like as it sews. But if I touch the picture, there is the flat lock opened and I can see that my left needle thread, which is yellow on the screen, makes the ladder stitches. My upper looper thread, which is shown in blue, makes the chain stitches. And my lower looper thread, which is shown in red, makes that little line of stitching on the side. So now it's easy for me to determine where to thread my threads so that I get them where I want them. And I love that feature on this machine. So do a test sew. And I did have to make some tension adjustments because I'm using decorative thread and a top stitch needle. And you can see where these adjustments are because the numbers have turned yellow. Well, what if you're planning on doing this stitch again, but you don't want to have to try to remember what your adjustments were? Well, if you touch the heart, you can save this to your permanent memory and then give it a name so that it's easy to find again. You can save up to 100 stitches on the L860 and L890, so you don't have to worry about all those post-it notes stuck to your machine with all your special settings. With your fabric, go ahead and cut two two and a half inch by eight inch strips from the olive fat quarter. And then along one long edge of each strip, press under a quarter inch to the wrong side. Then take one strip and place it right side up on the bed of the machine. Then take your ribbon and place it right side down. Line up the edges and guide them right along the blade of your presser foot. Then you're going to open up the flat lock and stitch the other green fabric on the other side of the ribbon. So when you're done, your block will look like this. And because we pressed under those raw edges, we're not going to have any raw edges butting against the ribbon. And isn't that glamour thread pretty? Just a fun decorative technique. Go ahead and give the block a press and trim it to four and a half inches by six and a half inches. I cannot overemphasize the need to test when working with decorative threads and non-ELX needles. You will really be happier with yourself when you do that. 
If you don't have the same width of ribbon that I had, then alter your fabric strips so that your block when it's trimmed will be four and a half by six and a half. So that's the first block done. Now we're going to make a rolled hem pin tuck block. Now, normally we associate a rolled hem with finishing the edges of our fabric. But if we stitch it down the middle of our fabric, we get pin tucks and it's a fun decorative effect. This time I use the Plum Fat Quarter and the Wonderfill Soft Lock. And this green color is called Amazon. I also pulled some Isocord embroidery thread to match my fabric. And this number is number 2764. And we're going to use the blind stitch foot again. Normally when I do a rolled hem on fabric edges, I want to trim the fabric a little bit, but we're going to be stitching on folds and I wanna make sure I don't trim any fabric. So I'm going to use that guide. And this is how I placed it on the machine this time. My knife is down and I've adjusted the guide so it's on that intersection right between the upper and the lower knife, which is pretty much all the way to the right. We are going to use a two thread rolled hem stitch number 13. Our knife is down and let's touch the hand icon to check our manual settings. If you're on a machine other than the 890 or the 860, you're going to pull out your stitch chart so you can check your settings. Now, of course, we're going to pull our rolled hem selection lever to the R, but because we're doing a two thread stitch, we are also going to engage our upper looper converter and I have it circled here. Now, in case you can't remember what the upper looper converter is or how you're supposed to install it, just touch on the icon and it will take you to this screen. And do you see that camera? If you touch that, you will get an animation showing you exactly what needs to be done. And the part involved is highlighted in yellow. So that makes it really easy to set up your machine. What I really love about this machine is the upper looper converter is actually attached to my upper looper, so there's no chance of losing it. You can also go into your guided mode at any time. I have my machine right now set up for the expert mode, but every once in a while I might forget how to do something. So if you click on this icon, it will take you step by step for setting up your rolled hem. So this is what your screen will look like. You've got your 90 needle in the right needle position. You have isocord in the needle and your soft lock is in your lower looper. And do a test sew. And I was happy with my settings. However, if you ever get a stitch that doesn't look quite right, if you click on that little hand down at the bottom of the screen, that's your stitch optimizer. And it's going to help you determine what you need to do to get your stitch exactly the way it should be. So don't forget it's there. To prepare your fabric, cut a six inch square from the plum fat quarter and press three creases spaced one inch apart. So I made the first crease in the center and then put an additional crease on either side. Now you're going to fold that fabric on the first crease wrong sides together and stitch a rolled hem guiding right along the guide of the foot. And then repeat with the other creases. Doesn't that look pretty? When you're done, you're going to press on the wrong side and then trim this to four and a half inches square. For uniformity, I would suggest that you stitch all of your pin tucks in the same direction. And let's set that aside. And our next block is going to be the puffing and piping block. For this block, you will need the coral flat, fat quarter, the cotton print, your pre-made piping, and the color of this one is leaf, and four spools of serger thread. And you're also going to need your gathering foot number 18. We're going to use this to gather one layer of fabric. And this time, we're going to use Creative Consultant. So touch the home button on your screen, and then the Creative Consultant icon and it will take you to a screen showing you a selection of fabrics. We're going to be using the medium weight woven, which is on the top row in the middle. If you're ever unsure of what the fabrics are, just touch the question mark and touch the fabric and it will tell you what it is. Then we will scroll to the stitch that we want to do. And again, if you're ever unsure, use your help. The gathering is number H. 
And on this screen, it tells us our recommended needles, thread, and stitch. And notice how it says to use foot number 18. If you touch that plus sign in the lower right-hand corner, it will take you to more information about the foot. Then go back in your bread breadcrumbs to the fabric and touch your green check to confirm. And now you're on the manual settings page. So make sure you take that upper looper converter out of the upper looper, put your rolled hem selection lever back to O, and thread both your left and right needle and both loopers and then touch the green check to confirm. And look, your machine has already set, up it, set itself up for gathering. The tensions have been adjusted as well as the stitch length and the differential feed. Now, if you do not have an 860 or an 890, on your machine, I would recommend taking your stitch length as long as it can go, increase your differential feed all the way, and then start by adjusting both needle tensions to somewhere between seven and eight and do a test sew. The higher your needle tensions will be, then the tighter your gathers. Then from your fabrics, you're going to cut a two and a half inch by 21 inch strip from the print and two three inch by eight inch strips from the coral. And we're going to gather both long edges of the cotton strip. Now I guided my fabric just along the right edge of the foot, so it's trimming just a little bit. And you'll want to take your time because as the fabric gathers behind the foot, it sometimes wants to curl back on itself and sometimes go play with the loopers and you don't want it to do that. So just keep an eye on it. And once you've gathered both edges, give it a light press and trim to eight inches long. Those gathers sure turn out pretty with the gathering foot. Now we are on a four thread overlock, but we want to go back to the default settings. Quickest way to do that is to press clear, so go ahead and do that. And then attach your piping foot, number 16, and use the large one. Now again, to review, the piping foot is for making and inserting piping and for inserting zippers. And you can use a diameter up to about a quarter of an inch. And this foot is best for the medium and heavyweight fabrics. I've got an arrow pointed to that groove that goes the whole length of the foot so your piping and your zippers are guided perfectly straight. What you're going to do is sew piping to both sides of your gathered strip. So take the raw edge of the piping and line it up with the raw edge of the gathered strip and then place it under your foot so that the piping is feeding into the groove. You're gonna have minimal trimming happening and then do that on the other side. Then we're going to add the coral strips so the coral strip will be placed right side down, lining up the raw edges, and feel for that piping so that you get it feeding through the groove of the foot again. And when you're done, press the block and trim to four and a half inches by six and a half inches. That sure is a pretty effect there. Now, if you want tighter gathers, you can increase your needle tensions, and you can also adjust your gathers by releasing the needle threads on both sides of your seam. So it's a good idea to test sew because there is not a magic formula for the length of strip you need because it's dependent upon your fabric and thread choices. So if you wanna start making a library of gathered strips, you can measure a length, write down the settings you use, gather, and then measure the length of it when it's done. And that'll give you a reference for future projects. And as I said, testing is always a good idea. For our last block on this side, we're going to do a double thread flat lock and chain stitch block. So I'm going to use the blue, flat, blue fat quarter and then a spool of isocord to match, and then I'm pulling out my decorative threads. The two on the top will be used when we do the flat lock. And they're both by Wonderfill. The variegated is Wonderfill Fruity and the color is Pansy, and the purple is called Deep Magenta. Then when we go to the chain stitching, the red thread is a deep rich tomato and the glamour is golden brown. But you go through your thread collections and see what you have to use. We're going to go back to that blind stitch foot because it's perfect for guiding for the flat lock. This time, attach it to your machine and center the guide between the two needle pins in the stitch plate. 
we're going to use the two thread flat lock wide, which uses the left needle, which is stitch number 11. So put your 90 needle in the left needle position and lower the knife because we're not going to be trimming any fabric. Increase your cutting width to eight. Now we are going to put both decorative threads through one thread path, and this is gonna be really fun. So here's a picture of my machine, and I've got the fruity thread on the lower looper spool pin and the magenta thread on the upper looper spool pin. And I brought them down both to go through the lower looper. And the isocord is in the left needle. Now with air threading, two threads through the air threader are sometimes a little bit tricky to thread when they're, you're just holding them. So this is when you're going to want to use a thread cradle. So take a length of serger thread that's twice what you would normally use and fold it in half. Then thread the, the, the ends of the thread into the air threading nozzle and hang on to that loop. Because if you don't, this is gonna whoosh right through your air threader. So you can see in the top left of my picture that the ends of the threads have come through the looper. Go ahead and pull on those ends until you have just a loop right above the air threading nozzle and thread your decorative threads through that loop. Then pull on the thread tail and you can easily pull both threads through the threading path and do a test sew. And I found with my threads that the default tensions work just fine. Cut an eight inch square from your blue fat quarter and then mark three lines spaced one and a half inches apart on the right side. Don't worry about them showing the thread is going to cover this up. Then fold the fabric wrong sides together on one of the lines. Guide the fold along the blade and stitch. And then you're going to open the flat lock. And you can see that open flat lock here on the left. And I just love how that purple thread kind of shadows the variegated thread. So you're going to stitch all of those on those lines that you made. The chain loops are going to be on the right side of the fabric. Okay, so that's what your block is going to look like at this point. We're now going to convert our LA90 to a two thread chain stitch, which is stitch number 16. However, if you don't have this capability on your machine, consider going to your sewing machine and doing a decorative stitch. I wanted to show you what the guided mode looked like. So we'll touch the guided mode button and we'll go through the steps for setting up the machine. And then you just press on the arrows on the right to go to each page. So we will have to unthread the, all of our thread paths. And the machine does say attach presser foot C13, which comes with the machine, but we're going to use the clear foot. So use that foot instead. It is one of my favorites. And because we're going to be stitching on some marked lines, it makes it a lot easier. You're going to put the 9014 needle into the right cover position. You're going to drop your knife and then adjust your cutting width down to five. And the reason we do that is so that the cover stitch insert will fit nicely on the machine. And you're also going to deactivate the upper looper. We do not use the upper looper when we're in cover and chain stitch mode, so we need to park it beneath the stitch plate. So there's a small knob on the left next to your air threading knob and you turn that to the left and press on the foot control, and then the upper looper will lock itself below the stitch plate. And you've got an animation that you can watch if you need more information. Our bold hem selection lever is at O, and then we're going to thread. So put the isocord thread in the right cover stitch needle, and then we're going to put the 12 weight threads through the chain looper. So here's how I have it set up on my machine. I have the tomato colored thread on the lower looper spool pin and the glamour thread on the chain looper spool pin. And I'm going to use a thread cradle just like we did before. However, I'm going through the chain looper threading path, which is purple. When you pull it through, you want to leave about a two inch tail. Don't leave it any longer because it might get caught in the door of the machine. And don't make it too short either, because it may not catch in the needle thread on the first few stitches. And do a test sew. And again, for me, the default settings worked well. 
On the wrong side of your square, mark lines between the flat lock stitching, and you're going to stitch the chain stitch from the wrong side between the flat locks. And then you're going to add another line of chain stitching on either side at the end, about a half inch away. So your needle thread is going to show on the wrong side, but your decorative stitching will show on the right. Trim your block to six and a half inches square. And then I recommend putting a drop of seam sealant, especially on the ends of the chain stitching, because the locking that happens at the beginning at the end has been now trimmed off and you don't want the stitching to come off before you get to putting the project together. Now, when working with decorative threads, I thought I would show you a couple of aids that would help if you're having trouble getting your tensions just right. And the first one is the decorative thread guide number L25. Now, you're looking at this and saying, ah, but the L means it only goes on the 850 and the 860. Well, with the thread guides, there's an exception to the rule, and this also works on the L890. So it inserts between the pretensioner and the tension discs on the top of the machine. And when you thread, you will bypass the pretensioner and go through the pigtail of, the, of this thread guide and then down through your tensions. So use this with heavy decorative threads when you can't loosen the tension enough. Maybe you're working with some stack threads or some threads that are just a little squirrely as they're feeding off of the vertical spool pin. Then you might want the decorative thread spool pin and this attaches on the back of the machine. You'll attach it to that spool and then put the thread cap on at the end. Now I will tell you, make sure you don't let that thread cap be too tight because the spool does need to turn. So use this if you're having trouble using your threads on the vertical spool pins. We're gonna put our sampler panel together, so go ahead and thread the machine for a four thread overlock stitch number one. Engage the knife, use the number 90 needles, regular serger thread, and the clear foot. Now take note of the marking on the foot that is even with the knife. It's on the far right hand side. That's what you're going to align your seam guide with. We want to do a little bit of trimming, but only a little bit, and this will help us control that. See how tiny my trimmings are? It's just a little bit. So arrange your blocks as shown, and so the green block to the purple block, and the coral block to the blue block, and then sew those two rows together, and then set this aside. Your front panel is done. Wasn't that fun? I really liked playing with the different feet and the decorative threads. But now let's work on the back side. Oh, before I forget, let's add some piping to the sides. So you'll put your piping foot on and add piping on the sides and also on the top and bottom. Now you can use the same color you used in the puffing and piping block, or you can change it up a little bit and use another color. It's all up to you. So now let's make the other side of the tote bag and we're going to do some piecing. We're gonna make a log cabin block. Now the overlocker for piecing is perfect because all of your raw edges are gonna be finished. So think about if you're making a tablecloth or a picnic cloth, you can piece it quickly on the overlocker and you don't have to add a backing or batting because all the raw edges will be finished. So we're gonna use the cotton print and then the fabrics from our blocks on the other side of the bag, plus one more and four spools of serger thread. From the cotton print, cut two three inch by width of fabric strips. And from one of the strips, cut a three inch square. And that's going to be the center of our block. Then from each of the fat quarters, cut a one and a half inch by 21 inch strips. And the way we're going to stitch this is we're going to sew, press, and trim and rotate. So take one of those strips, line up the raw edges right sides together and sew along one side of the square. Then press the seam away from the center and trim the blue strips even with the square. And then rotate and add the next strip. And we're going to keep stitching around the block in this manner, adding the colors of our strips. When the block is about eight inches square, you're going to stop. Now, don't stress too much if your strips aren't perfectly the same width. In fact, if you want to make it fun and crazy, make them all different widths. 
the last round is going to be with the cotton print. So add those in the same manner, press the block well, and then trim it to 10 and a half inches. Okay, so the front and the back panels are done. Let's talk about the handles. Now webbing makes perfect handles for our bag, but I think they're just a little boring. So let's add some fabric. We're going to use the cotton print, the webbing, and three spools of serger thread. And we're going to use the cover stitch compensation foot number 12, because our edges are going to be a little bit uneven. I like it that those left and right toes float and they compensate for that fabric unevenness. We're also going to use the accessories holder and the double fold binder attachment number 21. The accessories holder will attach to the cover stitch insert of your machine with two of the screws. And you wanna make sure you use both screws so that it will be stable. Notice how it swings out. This makes it easy to attach the binder attachment and to insert our fabric. Also, if you have to re-thread the machine at any time, you do not have to remove the binder attachment or the accessories holder. It will easily, the front cover will open and it's easy to re-thread. Now, a reminder that the fabrics do not have to be cut on the bias to use this attachment. However, it is a good idea when you're sewing a curve. We're going to use the three thread cover stitch number 24, which uses the center and right cover stitch needle. And we're going to use the size 90 ELX needle. Cut two one and three eighths inch wide with the fabric strips from your cotton print and grab that one yard of webbing. You're going to cut a point on one end of the cotton strips and insert it into the binder attachment with the wrong side facing you. Tweezers or a stylus will come in handy as you feed the fabric through the attachment. Then you'll pull an inch or so through and notice how both the top and bottom edges are folded under. You're going to swing it into place under the foot and take a few stitches. Now it's important to note that the foot should not be hitting the binder attachment. You have a couple of screws on the attachment to adjust the placement in front of the foot and to the left and the right, so you can get it exactly where you want it. And then you're going to put the webbing in and guide it along the binder attachment so that the binding wraps around it. And you do want to make sure that both needles are stitching in the binding. So now let me explain why I decided not to use a stitch using the left cover stitch needle. I wanted to use that left floating toe as a guide along the left fold of my binding. So that floating toe is riding on the webbing and the rest of the foot is on my fabric. Now, if you look at the front of the foot carefully, you can see the three markings for the three cover stitch needles. And when I used the left cover stitch needle, it was running a little too close for comfort along the edge of the fabric. And in fact, I blinked once and it went right off of it. So I said, well, I'm just not going to use that needle. So I chose to use the center and right cover stitch needle, guided along the left toe, and it was perfect. Now you can also use the clear foot because then you can see the fabric as it moves under in case anything wiggles on you. So the choice is up to you. Both feet work equally well. So bind both sides, and then trim them into two 18 inch straps. And wasn't that fast and easy to bind on our straps? Way easier than sewing one side, then folding to the other and top stitching the other side, I think. All right, so now it's time to put our bag together. So I do want you to refer to your handout for the assembly. It goes together pretty much like any tote bag. You are going to use a four thread overlock and I recommend putting a thread color in your left needle that matches the denim. That way, if perchance any seam were to stretch and you were to see it, you'd be seeing a matching thread. Now we are going to do a little quilting. So you're going to add the denim rectangles, paying attention to make sure you have the right ones going on the top and bottom and on the sides, and then fuse your fusible fleece to the back. Don't add the lining. We are just going to work with the bag 
outside and the fleece. Attach the clear foot and go back to your chain stitch. And on the sampler side, I put in green thread to match the piping and I stitched in the ditch between the piping and the denim. Put your needle down in the corners and then it's easy to raise the foot and turn. So it's gonna look really nice when it's finished. On the log cabin side, I decided to add that lace trim. And this time I used the clear foot 27. I put the lace through the slot on the front of the foot and guided it along the seam between the block and the denim. When I got back near the start, I pulled it out of the slot and trimmed it so I was overlapping about an inch. Now I did turn the corners and needle down, but because this is a trim, it kind of pooched up a little bit. So I took a hand needle and just tacked those little bits down and I thought it looked a lot better when they weren't hanging out there. Okay, so we're getting close to putting this together. Now we do want to box the corners. So you're gonna take your lining and your outer bag pieces and cut one and a half inch squares out of the bottom corners, both on the right and on the left. And then using a four thread overlock and the seam guide to control your trimming, you're going to stitch the outer bag and the lining bag separately. So you're gonna sew side seams and then the bottom seam, but don't go up into that corner that you cut out. Now on the lining, make sure you remember to leave about a five inch opening. You're going to need that to turn your bag right side out. So where you left those corners open, you're going to pull those flat and then stitch along to box the corners. And then the thread tails, you can use a chenille needle and tuck the threads into the seam or a little bit of seam sealant. Turn the outer bag right side out and then place the handles as shown, being careful not to twist the handles. Notice I did use pins to hold them in place, but they are well out of range of being hit by my needles. Then you're going to place the outer bag into the lining, right sides together and sew along the top edge. And you are going to wanna to take advantage of that free arm. Take the table off the machine and use the free arm to guide around the top of the bag. Then you're going to turn the bag right side out and that lining opening, you can go ahead and use the chain stitch or a hand needle and hand tack that closed. All right, we're almost done. You wanna press this bag really well, especially at the top because you want that lining to stay on the lining side. Then use the free arm and the chain stitch and top stitch around the top. And I did find it helpful to reduce my pressure foot, presser foot pressure just a little bit. Oh, and that's it. Your bag is done. So Randy, do we have any questions? Hi, Mary. Uh, Hi. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is from Pam. She said, uh, why do you adjust a cutting width on the flat lock if you are not using the cutting knife? Okay, that's a really good question. When we adjust the cutting width, it actually moves the stitch finger out so that we can get a wider stitch. So when you're at your machine, play with the dial on the front and adjust the cutting width and watch how that stitch finger moves to the left and right. And that's how we can get a wider stitch. Okay, and then uh, we have another question from Vicki. She said, how can you say lower the knife, we will not be cutting, then say our cutting width is eight? Be okay, that's the, it's basically the same question. Okay. When we adjust the cutting width, we are moving the stitch finger as well. So does uh, that yeah, I, I think that's it. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today and congratulations. Well, you haven't completed your tote yet, but you will. And I want you to go out and fill it with good things. And I hope you have fun surging for the rest of our serger month here in April. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.